So um, thank you everyone for joining us and I know that Ian's keen to get your questions at the end of the presentation um, and for now I will hand over to Ian. Thank you. Thanks Stephanie. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, I've, in, in my various jobs over the years, I have run lunchtime lectures. In fact, I think I suggested this to Stephanie. The secret with lunchtime lectures is to, is to fit them within an hour. So what I'll do is um, I'll go reasonably quickly through my slides uh, and try and get through that in less than half an hour. I'll be finished that by 12.30. Probably lost a few minutes already. And uh, give you plenty of time to ask questions. So. And then um, what we're doing today is this is the first of, of two. It was going to be one, but we realised there was so much content to cover that it'll be, uh, it's been split into two. So today I'll go through about half of it, and in a week's time, same time in a week, we will get together again. Uh, hopefully you can all attend again and uh, go through the other half of it. The second half tends to be more about the financial side of it. The first half is um, today's session is pretty much about uh, the concepts of running your own business and, um, and what investors are looking for. But the hard details of the costs will come in the second session. Um, firstly, please, um, oh, a little bit of background about me. I was, I was originally a graduated as a civil engineer, having gone through high school here at New Plymouth Boys High. And, um, and then um, um, enjoyed engineering, but actually preferred management. So I did an MBA when I was over in the UK doing my OE many years ago. And, um, and since then have uh, been in management. And the last, um, I retired from full-time work in 2014. And the last 10 years before that, I was running a private equity investment company in Wellington. That invested in, like would take a 50% ownership in small to medium sized companies and grow them. Um, but enough about me, uh, let's just have a show of hands please um, about you. Uh, who wants to run their own business or knows someone that wants to do that, please? <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. Uh, looks like a majority. Uh, and have you or they already started to do that? Okay, quite a few. That's great. There's a 50-50 there's a there. Um, Okay, so the title of the session is What Investors Want to Know. Um, this is quite a wide topic because investors are usually very cautious people and they want to know a lot before they will invest. And the first thing they will want to know is that you understand what is involved in running a business. Legally, a business is like a person. Uh, it, it, it has needs, has rights, has obligations, and while you may have started it and you manage it, it's not you, but there are obligations on you as its guardian. In many ways, a startup company is like a newborn baby that needs caring, nurturing, feeding, and developing. It starts out being totally dependent on you as the founder, and as it matures, it becomes less dependent on you, if only because there are other people involved in helping you run it. Similarly, um, as similar to a baby, a growing and maturing into an adult, including going through some challenging times for you, such as nappy changing, adolescence, and sleepless nights that go with that, um, companies will be very similar. I mention this because it's a convenient way uh, for you to view your startup company. A show of hands again, please. If you haven't started a company yourself, how many of you have been closely involved in raising a child? Ah, yes. <laughs> That's great. Okay, you'll be able to relate to what I'm talking about. So let's get on with the slideshow. Um, let me start by explaining that companies need a lot of things, but fundamentally they can't survive without a flow of money. That is their lifeblood. Without it, they fail. And that's the most common cause of failure for companies running out of cash. Now you may have plenty of cash yourself that you can feed into the company to keep it alive, but if you don't, you're probably going to have to attract investment from somebody else. That somebody else may be more than one person, it may be family or friends, or maybe independent professional advisors, sorry, investors. Whoever it is, you will have to sell yourself and your idea to them, and they will want to understand both the risks and the rewards of investing with you. 
So let's get started. Firstly, are you an entrepreneur? Lovely French word. It means a lot of things. But here's the test for you. Are you self-motivated? Sorry, I can't read that very well. I'll sit down. <laughs> are you self-motivated to be successful? Do you clearly understand what you have to offer? Do you have self-awareness? Are you willing to take financial risks? Do you know how to network? Do you have basic money management skills? Are you flexible? Because nothing ever turns out the way you think it will. So you have to adapt. Are you passionate about your venture? If you can tick all those boxes, that's a really good start. If you can't tick all those boxes at the moment, think about them. Will copies of this be available after the... Thanks, Stephanie. So you've got a checklist there. Um, your planned type of business. Um, sorry, I will have to sit down because I can't read it. I've got four types of business. I'm calling the first traditional. Traditional because it does what 30 years ago just about all businesses did, which was they made something or they provided a service and they sold that and made a dollar in the process. There's a lot of traditional businesses around still. In fact, the major employers in New Zealand are traditional business. Or is it technology based? So do you, um, is there some technology that you can protect, like patent or something like that, that will give you a market edge? And maybe you're not going to make anything, maybe you're going to, maybe you're going to lease your, um, you're going to lease out your, your or license out your technology. Is it what we call a SAS, S-A-A-S? Anyone not heard of a SAS before? Okay. Software as a service. So what's a good example? Um, zero software. Um, zero accounting software. Software as a service. And they can be big. They can grow very quickly and they can be very profitable, as you will have seen with zero. Or is it a not-for-profit? And I throw that in because I've been involved with startup weekends and things like that, and I am aware that people do develop businesses where they want to create a local network, and it's a kind of a local service, and, um, and it's a great thing to do, um, but it's not really looking, it's not focused that much on the commercial success, it's focused on the social good that it does. Now, there is no right answer here. Um, you can be any of those. But I think it's really important for you, right from the beginning, to understand which category you're in, because that dictates a whole lot of um, um, behaviours and answers to questions that come up after this. Okay, so what are your intentions? And this is really important. When people come, I run the local angel group, well, when I say run it, I'm the chairman of it, and most of the opportunities come to me in the first instant. And the first question I ask people when they come to me with a, with a new startup company is, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to grow and sell? In other words, it has to have an exit opportunity. You might grow it for five or seven or ten years and then sell it on to somebody else. Um, and, and, and you will have seen a number of people do this in recent times and potentially make a lot of money in the short term. Um, and and that, I mean that's that's really very valid uh, reason for starting a company. Or do you want to build and hold it, which I call a lifestyle company? So again, there is no right answer to this except the answer that really is deep in your heart. Do you actually want to build something and you know you might be young and you want to have something for the rest of your working career and you want to grow at a pace that you're comfortable with so you're going to have fewer um, uh, sleepless nights 
Um, or do you want to build something really quickly, add a lot of value, and, and probably have more sleepless nights? Um, because you will probably have investors, uh, apart from yourself, involved. Whereas if you go for a lifestyle business, often you don't want to bring other investors in because you don't want that pressure put on you. So those are the two. And I think it's really important for you to get your head around uh, that before you actually embark on um, uh, well, building your company and certainly embark on raising capital. <coughs> right. So those are some big issues to start with. Now, planning your business. Now I'll run down through all these because this is, this is just an index, really. Sorry. Um, right. And the shaded ones are the ones we're doing today. Um, the from four through to nine are really money related. And you might think, well, people's not money related. But I assure you that the biggest cost in your startup business will be wages and salaries. And so uh, people is very much a monetary issue. So we'll go through product, stroke service, uh, market, and channel to market. Oh, there's another one on the bottom. OK, the product or service. Um, this is the number one question that everyone will ask you. If you've got this brilliant idea for a product or service, they'll want to know what problem it solves. Because if it doesn't solve a problem, no one's going to pay you for it. Or even if you're running a charitable thing, no one's going to use it. So that'll be a heartbreaking experience for you. So work out before you even go, go put one step out there in terms of starting your own business, what problem it solves. And the second thing you need to do is work out, is, is test that theory. Because don't assume that you will know. In round figures, and I haven't, got, I haven't got scientific evidence to prove all this, but I've been told by a number of um, uh, people involved in, in psychology that about 10% um, about of people are prepared to be leaders. And if you're going to start your own business, you actually want to be one of those 10% who's prepared to be a leader. And you will be. I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room is here. You wouldn't be here otherwise. The two, um, there's about 20% of the people that actually think with their brains and 80% think with their hearts. And again, there's no right or wrong in that. It's just that people make emotional decisions and the vast majority make an emotional decision. So if you combine those two, um, the 20% that, uh, uh, that think with their heads and the 10% that um, are prepared to be leaders, you end up with about 2% of the population who are actually <laughs> going to be good entrepreneurial um, leaders of businesses. So, and, and just about everyone in this room, I'm sure, fits into that 2% category. So here's my point. Don't think that you know what the other 98% think. Um, you need to go out there and test it in the market. Just because you think it's a good idea doesn't mean to say they will think it's a good idea. And, um, and, and, and really successful people are kind of in that 2% category, but they fully understand the other 98% and what they're looking for. But for you, um, um, well, those really successful people I've been talking about will do market research. And for you, uh, you need to... Um, you need to do product value uh, validation, which means, and that's not too difficult. Um, we won't go into the details now, but we can talk that through with you if, you if you want help. But there are ways to go out there and validate your product in the market. Your product needs to have unique competitive advantage. And because if all you're doing is copying somebody else and they're already in the market selling a product or service, then how are you actually going to capture um, from there? Your, your competitive advantage may be that you do it cheaper. Okay, that's no problem. But you need to recognise um, 
um, what you're really offering. And you need to understand what happens if you launch at a cheaper price and your competitor actually launches, uh, drops their prices to the same level, then where do you go? I mean, Dan Radcliffe that sat at IBHQ here uh, in Taranaki, it became in 10 years, became the biggest provider of services in, um, in volunteer tourism in the world. And he was not only the biggest provider, he was bigger than the next three added together. He was placing something like 15,000 people per annum globally. Um, and how did he do it? Other people were doing it when he got started, but he did it at about a third of the price that the others did it at, and did it on a scale that he could justify that price, and did it very successfully. IP searches and protection um, <coughs> investigated. Um, you need to know early on whether, you, whether there's somebody out there. You might think you've got this original idea, but you might, and you're gonna go and conquer the USA with it, for example, take an extreme example. Um, but it may be that someone's already got a patent for it in the U United States, or somebody's already launched it, or someone thought of the idea 50 years ago and patents have run out. So you need to uh, check. And there's um, Christian Slack is in the audience here today. He works with us at uh, uh, Launch Taranaki. He's a member of, of the Angel Group here. And uh, the first thing I do when I get a new opportunity coming in, I will often throw it, if there's any technology or whatever, in it, um, I will throw it at, at Christian to get his feedback. So those opportunities are available and they can save you a lot of money. I mean, it's worth spending a few bob um, early on to understand what your, uh, what the competitive situation is and what your, whether there's protection for your uh, intellectual property. Um, scalability. Uh, can you scale this? Because often you will not make enough money unless you can actually get it to a decent scale. Now you may be, you may be just targeting New Zealand with your product. You may be targeting Australia and New Zealand. You may be targeting global. Particularly if you're uh, basically uh, in a lifestyle business, you may just be targeting, you might just be targeting local. Um, Dan Radcliffe, who I mentioned before, that sold IVHQ, has started Shining Peak. So that's got a lot of uh, local target market. Although uh, I think he is starting to sell his cans through supermarkets. So he is expanding from that. But that's just a good example. Um, but you need to be able to, you do need to be able to scale. If it's totally dependent on you dealing with every customer, uh, then you are probably going to wear yourself out, burn yourself out before you actually get to a decent level of profitability. Your expected launch date and your expected product life cycle. Uh, life cycle. Um, these are all questions that investors will want to know. So you've got an idea at how you're actually going to launch your product because you can do all the, all, all the market research you like, but until you get your product in the marketplace, you don't know whether the product's gonna work properly, whether the market really will, the market might say, oh yeah, it's a fantastic idea, I'd really like to see that. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to have one of those. But you launch your product and they don't buy. So you won't really know until you launch it, and often after you've launched it, you have to go and tweak it. Um, or sometimes you have to change your, your, your marketing, or sometimes you have to change your pricing. So it's a really, from an investor's perspective, it's a really important thing to know is what is the expected launch date. Um, and what's the product life cycle? Because um, computer programs, um, in my experience, um, will probably have about a 10 year life cycle. And that means you have to get them operating well within the first three years so that you can make plenty of money out of them uh, for the next five to seven years before you either have to accept that it's got to the end of its product life cycle um, or you have to recreate the product. And good examples of that are like payroll systems. You know, we used to do payroll on, <coughs> we used to do it by hand and then we did it by desktop um, or did it by large computers. Then we did it by desktop computers and now you can do it 
on your iPhone, uh, run your run your payroll system. Okay, um, the market. So we've covered the product or service. You've got to have three things here, basically. Um, not in this, but uh, the three that I'm covering today are your product or service. It's your offering. A market that wants to buy it, and a channel to market, which will be the next slide after this. So we're talking about the market now. Um, okay, what are you going to sell your product or service? So what price are you going to sell your product or service at? All important. Market validation at that price. So you might have found out that people think this is a great idea. But when they know that when they find out it's going to cost them a hundred dollars per mousetrap, they might say, "Oh, hang on, hang on." I, think I, I can, you know, it sounded like a really good idea when you explained it to me. But at that price, I'm not sure I really want to be paying that for a mousetrap. How large? Sorry. How large is the available market at that price? Um, it's what's often known as the uh, accessible or addressable market. Um, but really what it means is uh, the available market at that price. Because there might be a big... I mean, take mousetraps again. A lot of people buy mousetraps. But for what you're offering, which might be a premium mousetrap, um, what's the market size? And, and it might not cost $100. It might cost $20. And you can buy those disposable ones for two dollars each. How many people are going to pay twenty dollars? And what's the size of the market at that level? There may be a good market at that level, but you need to know what competition. What competition exists, or is likely, because there may be people starting up at the same time as you. What share of the market will you capture? So that's that's. Um, related to the size of the addressable market and the competition in that market. And often competition is people just doing the same as they were doing before. There will still be some people who are using manual payroll systems. So, um, you know, if you've, got, if you've got a smart payroll system, you're never going to get 100% of the market. And what are the market geographies? So, uh, I mean, if you look at the global market, the size of the global market, where do they sit around the world? And how <coughs> readily can you access those? Um, most companies I know of will really start out saying, well, we're going to conquer the world, but that means the English speaking well. So that cuts back your market substantially <coughs> initially. And what are the barriers to entry? <coughs> okay. And the final slide. Channels to market. Now this is the most commonly forgotten. Um, well, out of these three, this is most commonly forgotten when people are starting up their businesses. They work out that they've got a product or service they work out that they can do it really well. They worked out that there's real market demand there for it. Um, they may have even launched their product. And they've got, I mean, that's the ultimate market validation is launching a product. But they haven't thought through how they're actually going to connect themselves with this fantastic product or service that they've created and the market. So it's like you making a new soft drink, and it's fantastic. And you've tested it in the market, and everyone says this is the best soft drink I've ever tasted. And you know there's people screaming out for you know, this new organic product. But you've got to have the supermarkets, or somebody, the organic shops, or someone. You've got to have a channel. You might be able to sell it from your, from, from, from your front door um, immediately, but once you, you don't get much volume out of that. So once you, 
once you start growing, you actually need to have nationwide coverage. And if you're going to go through the supermarkets, for example, the big supermarket chains will want you to have national coverage. So, and then you've got to get shelf space off them. Now, people do do that. Do that. You'll see new products turning up on the shelves in the supermarkets. But for everyone that turns up there, it will probably be 10 that have been rejected and are struggling to, to, to get traction because of it. So I just use that um, as an example. Um, not saying it's as, this is a showstopper at all, um, but you have to think it through how you're actually going to do this. So, how is it proposed to take the product or service to market? I've talked about that. What are the sales and distribution channels? Now, your initial channels may be different from your later channels. So you may start out selling your product initially just on Taranaki. And that might be okay because you can get friends and family involved or you know people that have got a shop that will help you sell it. But sooner or later, again, I talked a lot about Dan Radcliffe, but Dan Radcliffe's shining peak, you know, he started out by launching his bar here and targeting Taranaki people, or targeting New Plymouth people, essentially. But then, next step was he wanted to sell nationwide. So he's had to, uh, he's had to sort out channels through the supermarket chains to be able to do that. So, so that was an initial channel versus the later channel. And the other thing, the other reason why you might have an initial channel is if you're developing a product that's got a bit of technology in it and you've got to do product development, so you launch your product early <coughs> as a basic product, what they often call an MVP, a minimum viable product. You, you know, you've got something that works, but it's still got a lot more <coughs> development to go on. You actually want to launch it to what we call early adopters early adopters, they are people that are prepared to give it a go. You know, while I said there are only 2% of people that are probably uh, going to run their own businesses, there's probably only 0.2% or 0.02% of people that are prepared to try somebody else's technology <coughs> at an early stage. So you've got to find those early adopters and then you want to work with them really closely. You want to have a direct sales link with them so that you can get feedback about your product. And you may have to actually give them that product free of charge for the first three months on the basis that they're going to get the benefit of your product, but <coughs> they're going to give you the feedback that you need. And, 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 and so maybe for the first year or 18 months, you will continue to actually sell directly like that because you need to continue to get that feedback. But once you believe that you've got what we call product market fit, which is that you've really developed your product to the point where the market is saying, hey, we love this and, uh, and they're buying it without too much prompting, then you might want to have a distributor or something like that. And um, so that's really important um, to know how you're going to start out, what channels you're going to use initially and what channels you're going to use later. Advertising and promotion, um, again, um, you want to get your product to the point where you're confident that it's not going to be too faulty before you go out there and promote it too hard. But um, you will need to build the brand and promote. So there you are, roughly half an hour. Um, over to you for questions. Well, look, the, the ultimate test is, is, uh, is launching a product 
and getting people, getting early adopters to use it. And I'll guarantee you, I've never seen a product launch that got it right the first time. Um, they, they will always need that valuable feedback. And it may be that the idea is great. I've seen plenty of things like, you imagine something that makes milking in a cow shed um, more efficient. And, and, and you get it, you use it, um, um, and you might come off a farm. So you actually make one for yourself and it all works fine. And then you sell it to some, some, to some others and it breaks down. Why does it break down? Because they're not going to care for it like you do. It's your baby. If you're really caring for it, you give it to somebody else, they'll break it. And, 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 yeah. <coughs> and it may not even be the owner of the farm. It may, it may be just some hired staff for it. So that's what we call industrialization, uh, to industrialize the product if it's going to be used in an industrial setting. <coughs> and you'll be, you won't believe how quickly people can break things that you think are seriously robust. So no, um, the, the, only, the only real market validation is actually launching your product and getting it used by the market. Paying customers. Yeah. I just had a question related to <coughs> product validation as well. Like what are some different examples of how you could validate your product? Sorry, say again? What are some different examples of how you could validate your product? Or well, the ways you can validate it? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, um, we're filming this, so I'll just repeat the questions I should do. Yeah, the question is, uh, what are some of the ways to validate uh, products? Um, well, it, it's never going to be perfect for the reasons I just mentioned, and that is that the best way is to launch your actual product. But um, you can go, and interview, I mean, the, the startup, I don't know if you've been on a startup weekend, but uh, the startup weekends um, uh, run for like 48 hours. And, and, and that people are in teams with bright ideas and they're developing a, a, a product or service. And the first thing um, they have to do is, uh, is go online, contact people, contact people they know. So we've got this bright idea. Um, I was involved with the startup weekend, it was here in New Plymouth, not like the one that was just run down in Harwar. And they went out onto the street on the Saturday morning and interviewed people in the street and said, if I made this, would you buy it? And people said, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Now, how reliable is that? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, but it's better than doing nothing. And, uh, uh, and, and again, uh, ask people that don't necessarily think with their heads and, uh, um, <coughs> you know, ask people that think with their hearts because that's where your major market is. Yeah, and there are, there are social, I mean, you can use social media and all that sort of stuff. Um, Stephanie will probably know what, the, what they did in this last startup weekend for validation. Yeah, um, they went out and talked to people in the streets. Um, they also did um, phone surveys, um, a um, Facebook um, sort of polls and um, questionnaires um, using Google. Survey Monkey, um, yeah, so getting sort of that feedback and making sure that your questions are quite specific, so not just would you buy this product or service, it's more around what would you pay for this, do you currently have a product that is answering this problem, how much do you pay for that, so along with the market validation, also that price point um, validation as well. And um, I mean, the startup weekend is over 48 hours, so really you can't do in-depth market validation. But you can, like for example, if you came up with something that was going to be a hardware type of product, uh, you can go and talk to the manager at Mitre 10. You know, they'll, um, they'll make time for you, or someone there, a senior manager there, or, and talk to them and say, hey, uh, if, I, if I develop this product, would you be prepared to stock it? And, they, and they'll give you feedback. The short answer might be no, they're not prepared to stock it because they only take products like that from large suppliers. But given that you've made the effort to go and contact them, um, they're quite likely to give you some feedback. 
on whether they think your, your idea is any good or not, or whether there's a gap in the market? Um, Ian, you were talking about um, barriers to entry, and I was kind of wondering if you could explain a little bit more about that, like where your big barriers, if they can be overcome, can kind of act as a moat, and then low barriers, you can test your products really easily, mm. um, but it also means anyone can follow you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one barrier to entry is if you haven't got freedom, what we call freedom to operate, FTO, um, because somebody else has already got a patent on that and uh, on that concept. Um, there are others like if you're going into the United States with food or, or medicine or anything like that, you've got the F FDA, Food and Drug Agency, authority. What's FDA stand for, Christian? Anyway, the FDA. And, and I mean, that's a major barrier. Uh, my son works at uh, Fisher and Pico Healthcare, and you wouldn't believe how long it took them to get FDA approval for their ventilators. Um, years. So those are the sort of barriers. Um, um, sometimes with software, increasingly, the people are worried about uh, sovereign control over privacy. So, you know, I've involved with a company that had software in the insurance sector, um, health insurance sector. And so there were, there were privacy constraints um, that you had to meet to be able to, um, uh, for collection of data. So that's, um, you know, those are sort of barriers. They're, yeah. I mean, if it's alcoholic beverage, there may be barriers on that as well. Food, I mean, there's quite a few barriers in terms of food. They're not insurmountable. I'm not saying that they're a showstopper, but um, they can be quite costly and time consuming to actually. Uh, right, get. so from an investor perspective, how will they like evaluate whether or not? Oh, That's how would they? Bad. I mean, mm. I can't go and mm. launch my own home built rocket from my backyard to compete with Rocket Lab, which is a good thing for Rocket Lab, <laughs> but it's cost them a lot of money to get there. Um, so, because they kind of, the more you invest in them, so long as I guess at the end of it, you yeah. actually can sell your product, you might be building kind of a moat. But, yeah. yeah. How does that kind of, is there like an optimum pathway through that? or? No, it's horses for courses with these yeah. things, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, and it, 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 they can be legal, they can be social barriers, they can be all sorts of barriers. It just depends on, um, yeah, just depends on the circumstances, really. And, sorry, can I just add to that? I think with the angels as well, um, potentially getting alongside someone who maybe understands invariants would be, um, you know, that may be more keen. So like that's sort of that stakeholder investor sort of relationship. Um, right, where it's kind of their business domain already. Yes, yeah, so they sort of have the know-how or the connections or the to break down barriers for you um, could be a potential um, way to go if you knew exactly sort of what you needed help with. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we can. I mean, it's a, it's a big question for us. And, and uh, like if someone comes to the angel group with a proposal that, um, uh, and we think that there are barriers, um, we will certainly ask questions. It's possible that we may be able to help you overcome those, but we probably would want to know that you're fully aware of them and you've made a lot of inquiries about them already. Hmm. I mean, we don't we do, we don't turn down that many on the grounds that uh, uh, on those on those grounds, but yeah, we do we do see some of them. What, what about services and keeping to product? For example, my um, business is a service. Um, it's not an actual. We we are produce, providing things, but it's a service that's new. Um, in comparison to actually having a product. Yes, yeah, sorry, my hearing's not perfect. Uh, services, like our service, yeah. we're offering our business as a service. It's a new service yeah. um, that isn't available at the moment. It's a new niche. Yeah. So what about that in comparison to actual product? Yeah, well, I mean, um, 
Um, your services, it's hard, it's hard to like, uh, get patent protection on a service. You can get patent protection on a, on a product. So in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of barriers and things like that, that's, services tend to be much easier. But the same rules apply. You know, just most of what I've gone through here will apply to whether it's a product or a service. And um, I mean, it's, I take zero as an example again. Is zero a product or a service? Um, it's a kind of, you know, in the past you would buy like MYOB on a disc and you'd download it to your computer and it was software. So it was a kind of a product. Um, now they. They don't, you don't download it onto your computer. You actually use it and it's based on some computer on the other side of the world and uh, maybe on the west coast of the USA. So that's why they call them, that's why software as a service has become a new sort of category. It's, is it a service or is it a product? I don't know, the, the grounds get a little bit blurred. But if you are providing a service like an advisory service to people, um, I mean, I'm associated with Automio, uh, Claudia King of Dennis King Law, who's got software, has developed a, a, a software as a service product, really, which um, helps lawyers run their law firms online and provide documents online. But it does a whole lot more than that. Claudia is actually running webinars and coaching people. And so it's kind of moved from a software as a service, which was a bit of a product, to a consultancy service, coaching advisory type stuff. And, and strategically, we're having to decide which way to go, because if you want to, if you want it to be scalable, um, it's difficult if you're gonna run it as a coaching model. But if you want it to be, uh, if you run it as a SaaS product like Xero, what I call a pure SaaS, then it's much easier to scale it. So if we develop a software specific to our service, then we would need to protect that software properties. Yeah, it, uh, again, it's, it's, it's horses for courses a bit here. Just depends on the circumstance, what service you're trying to provide. And whether you want to run a lifestyle business or whether you want to run a growth and, and exit. Um, I mean, generally speaking, if you're, if you're going to run a consultancy type service or an advisory service, it's better to be a longer term thing because you're not going to be able to sell it for a big, big dollar at the end anyway. <coughs> um, it'll be your network that you've built up and your personality that causes it to be successful. If you then want to pull out of that, Who's going to buy it off you if you want to retire and do nothing? Um, they'll, um, you know, who's going to pay you for that? Whereas if you've got something like, again, I keep using zero, but it's one we all know. You build zero. Well, Rod Drury's retired now and living in the Bahamas or whatever, and 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 the company just keeps on chugging on because it wasn't dependent on him at all, really. Franchises, Ian, you were talking about services. So if you have a service model, it starts up and then you look at, look at franchising. Yeah, franchising, yeah, absolutely, yeah, mm. yep, yeah, yeah. And then franchising happens with both services and with products, really. I mean, you know, um, Subway and all those chains in New Zealand are basically, McDonald's are basically built on franchises. Because I guess if you had something like that, that would give it scalability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, the franchising, uh, franchising is, uh, uh, was, I just, I hesitate because I'm just thinking, is it, is it, does it fit into the business models that I mentioned? Um, there's kind of variation on them. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, there's a lot of success stories with franchising. But if you're going to get on the franchising model, you need to get advice early on um, because it will affect how you set up the company it'll affect a whole lot of things that you do. So you want to get some good legal advice early on on that. There are, there are lawyers around and I think, I think uh, Venture Taranaki will, um, knows quite a bit about franchising and will, know, and will know who you should take advice from early on to get set up in the right format.
early protection of your idea if you're um, looking at a, a new idea in terms of an intellectual property? Uh, uh, the best advice I can give you is sitting in this room. Uh, Christian, 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 Christian Slack is a global expert on this. And uh, he, he has, um, uh, Christian came to New Zealand about 15 years ago from the UK. And we are very lucky to have him uh, in our community. Um, but um, you can link into him, um, or Vince Taranaki knows all about Christian, and, and I do too. So you can link into him um, one way or the other, but you're probably better to start with uh, Vince Taranaki and talk to them about, about that. Because what we, we have to try to do is um, and not overuse Christian because he, <laughs> if everybody's ringing him on a daily basis, uh, it won't work. But um, when you get to the right point uh, with the development of your idea, then uh, it's really valuable having Christian around because he's, he's a great... So what he does is searches for what's called prior art. Is there any of this out there in the marketplace um, globally that uh, um, would stop you being able to operate or stop you uh, being able to patent, take protection. But you need to develop your idea far enough. Uh, it's not fair on Christian to go to him and say, oh, I've got 20 ideas, which of these do you think are going to work? <laughs> it would probably take him 20 months to give you an answer because he'd be overloaded. Um, you mean in terms of their ideas? Yeah, or thinking about the things you've gone through today, where's oh, yeah. probably, where's, where is it most often? Oh, oh okay. Well, it, number one's what problem does it solve? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if it doesn't solve a problem, uh, you aren't going to go anywhere. Um, and, um, and then probably the entrepreneurial thing, the leader, you know, who's going to lead this? Because angel investors are actually investing in people. And, and they're investing in one or two people, like the founders, um, which is interesting. Um, is one founder better than two founders, better than three founders? I've found the most successful ones, companies that I've been involved in have probably had two founders um, who complement each other. And they can be a husband and wife team. Um, some angels say I'll never invest in a husband and wife team, but I, I haven't had any bad experiences that way. Um, but, um, I mean, you know, Juno Gin is a good example here. We haven't invested in that because that's actually, uh, my assessment is a lifestyle business. They actually want to build, and, you know, they're not looking to do something quicker. They want to build a, a business for their lifestyle and possibly hand it on to their children. So that, um, yeah, um, two of them, and they complement each other very well. One's strong on marketing, the other strong on production, and they've both got a reasonable understanding of finance. Three can be a bit of a problem. The thing about three people is that if they talk one-to-one, -one, you can have three different discussions. If there's only two people and they talk one-to-one, -one, they only have one discussion. But as soon as you've got three, one can talk to two, two can talk to three, three can talk to one. And, and often the coordination isn't nearly as good as it is with just two. And once you get to four, it's probably too many. What about single founders? What about? Single founders, if there's just one. Yeah, well, single founders, I mean, uh, yeah, single founders is good. Um, oh, it's okay. But it puts a lot of load on the single founder. And those things I went through before when I was using the analogy of raising a child. It's like a solo parent versus, um, you know, versus two or, 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 or more. And um, so, because and it does get stressful. There will be sleepless nights. You know, even with the best will in the world and, and the, the, the greatest confidence in the world, you all have bad days. So having somebody else to share that with is actually quite useful. But hey, look, it's not a showstopper. None of these are showstoppers. 
If you, if you, if you don't solve a problem, that's a showstopper. <laughs> Um, at the very beginning, you talked about the kind of need for flexibility from yep. um, entrepreneurs. Um, kind of another common theme I've seen with successful entrepreneurs that it's just like a dog of determination. So how do you balance that out? Where you don't want them to fold straight away, but they need to be kind of malleable, I guess. In the next session, one of, one of the um, bullet points will be governance. Um, and it's a really... You, you have to manage risks. You've got a lot of risk at the startup company and you have to manage those risks. Now, if you're a founder, you can't afford to be a person that gets out of bed every morning and thinks of the thing, all the things that can go wrong. So how do you handle that? The best way to handle that, I think, is to have a, a board or a director, an independent director, who might, you know, a chair. So there might be two founders. And so you have a board with the two founders and this independent person. And the independent role of that, because um, I often fulfil that role. Um, people come to me in uh, early stage and, I'll, and they want me to be involved. And so I, I do, particularly if I'm investing a reasonable amount of money in it myself, I'll say, OK, but I want to be an independent director and, uh, and I'll chair the board meetings. And, and my role on that is probably three things, actually. One is the risk management. So I'm the one that says, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Have you thought of the other thing? And the founders are quite happy with that because that means they don't have to get out of bed every morning thinking about what can go wrong. They know I'm worrying about it <laughs> and challenging them on it. And their role is to actually think positively and mine is to think cautiously, OK? Um, the, other, the other areas that um, um, I provide um, probably an invaluable service is raising capital because I know how funders think and so I can prepare the documents and, and talk to the potential investors. Um, um, not on my own. I mean, they want, to know, they want to hear from the founders, but they also want to know that there's somebody there that's going to make sure that if they put $100,000 into the company, that's going to be spent on what we said it was going to be spent on. Um, and the third thing um, where I add value is people problems. I mean, founders are not very good at managing the people, they're often not very good at managing the people under them because what happens is uh, they can't understand why everyone else won't work as hard and it's for as long hours for as little money as they get. <laughs> um, and the answer is quite simple. Uh, the founder owns the business and the others don't. So I help them through that and structure ways where they can have share schemes and things like that. But um, yeah, that's... Um, that's a long way of answering your question, hopefully. Aside from the obvious planning and um, intention and product and service, when it comes to founders, you said you invest in the people. What kind of characteristics and traits do you look for in people that you would want to invest in? Oh, that checklist that I had up there before um, goes a long way. I mean, you want people that are not going to quit. Um, that can, you know, handle the sleepless nights when they have them. And the sleepless nights are usually caused by <sighs> running out of money, frankly. You don't know how you're going to pay the wages. And um, you don't have to be a startup to have that problem, but, but, but small companies tend to have that. Cash flow is a major. Um, um, but, yeah, resilience, really, determination. Motives, you know, what are the motives? Uh, and and uh, are those robust? Um, and and skill, um, well, and flexibility. Are they because things won't go perfectly? So are they capable of when this doesn't work? Because they always have a very strong idea about how they're going to do it, and this is going to work. And I know, you know, total confidence. <coughs> but but when it's obvious that that isn't going to work, will they take a different tack? It's called a pivot in the game. Will they, will they, can they handle a pivot with the company? They also need to be coachable. And that, you know, sometimes I know I've come across enterprise owners and they just won't listen. You know, yeah. You, you can give people advice, but they're not actually prepared to hear it. Like you can have all those things, but if you're bringing on investors, you actually need to be prepared to listen to the investors and sometimes change your mind. 
Like yeah, yeah, exactly. And the, and the, the thing I've found too, I mean, look, hey, I'm I'm a baby boomer. I'm one of the earliest baby boomers. Um, so I I do not know anywhere near as much about what these millennials that come along with bright ideas. Uh, I, I don't understand their market anywhere near as well as they do. I never will. I don't understand technology as well as they do. I don't. So I, I just make sure that I stick to what I, what I can, where I can add value, and give them plenty of rope and support to do what they know much better than I do. They know 80% of it. I know 20%. 20% is the th three things I mentioned before. Generally speaking, that's how it works out, and that's what they're looking for from me. They want, they want me to fill those gaps. And um, um, but to give them plenty of rope and support to go and do what they want to do. Great, thank you so much, Ian. Can we have a round of applause? I love that you guys had you. You actually filled half of this time with questions. So um, some great questions um, from for Ian. Um, so thanks so much for your participation, and we look forward to having you all back here. Um, same day, same time, but we're actually going to be downstairs um, in our boardroom to finish off um, the other seven sort of points that you sort of need to know um, and the questions um, that investors would ask you around that whole business model. So we look forward um, to that. There was a lot of questions and um, I will make sure that you have all the slides so you can go through them in your own time. Um, but um, as Ian said, Vincenton Lackey is always here to help. Um, so if there's things that you feel like you need to understand more um, around, um, it's just getting in touch.